Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little for PokerCoaching.com here today with another hand from the $10,000 buy-in Super Millions that takes place every week on GG Poker. We had an incredibly stacked final table this week, including Anatoly Filatov, absolute crusher in the high stakes games. We have Isaac Haxton, Juan Dominguez, David Peters, Elio Fox, Bruno Volkman, whose final table this tournament the last two weeks in a row. He took eighth place two weeks ago and won it last week. Uh, and I'm I'm sure that all these other players are very good too. I just do not personally know them. Let's take a look at the players we will be discussing today. We have Isaac Haxton. Isaac Haxton is a poker player who's been around for a very long time. He was actually at my first World Poker Tour final table a long time ago. He ran an insane bluff where he, I think, three bet all in on a four straight river with the nut low. His opponent also had basically the nut low and uh, he folded. So uh, Isaac Haxton gets in there and battles. He... Enjoys bluffing every time I play with him, but um, I mean, look, Super Crusher in live poker, as you can see here, $27 million. Super Crusher on GG, $8.4 million. Absolute Crusher in heads-up games. This guy, he, he may be literally the best poker player in the world. His opponent, Bruno Volkman, who, like I said, took first place last week and eighth place the week before. As you can see here, two wins, eight final tables, 14th cash, not a huge in the money percentage, right? But two wins, eight, eight final table. This guy makes a deep run every time. Well, he gets deep. So good job. Good work for him. Let's take a look at this very interesting spot. We are down to seven players. I'm sorry, eight players at this final table. I can't count. And Isaac Haxton is a big chip leader with about 60 big blinds. Anatoly Filatov also has about 60 big blinds. But then everybody else is kind of medium stack. There is no obvious short stack, which is... Rather interesting. Uh, remember the payouts on GG, I'll show them to you again, are relatively flat. That said, there's still quite a big difference between eighth place and first place. So the short stacks do need to try to make something happen here. And compared to some of the hands that we have reviewed previously on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash poker coaching, there is no obvious short stack. So the medium stacks in this scenario, like the 20 big blind stacks, 25 big blind stacks, 30 big blind stacks, they get to play a little bit more than they perhaps normally would. So let's take a look at this hand. Jay Anderson, ace nine offsuit from early position is an easy fold. Bruno with 20 big blinds. One is the only other player with 20 big blinds. Bruno opens it up to 2.5 big blinds. And if I was in Juan's shoes here, I would probably just rip it all in and I'd be out of the tournament. It's a tough spot here, actually, with 20, 20 big blinds against Bruno, who should be pretty tight. Because you got to realize, when Bruno is opening, he has to worry about, well, everyone. You have to act applying aggression to him, especially the big stack, Isaac Haxton and the big blind. And Juan just folds the ace stack. This is just good, hyper, ICM-aware poker. Over to Isaac Haxton. He likes to defend the Jack-10 offsuit. And this is an interesting scenario when it comes all middle cards, where there are big payout implications. That said, the payout implications are not quite as big as they normally are because there is no obvious short stack and Bruno is the shortest stack at the table you know equal with Juan but like he has 20 big blinds the other players have more than 20 right so this is a spot where Isaac does get to apply a decent amount of aggression if he feels inclined and I would not be shocked if from a GTO point of view he's supposed to have a leading range in this scenario um checking is obviously fine so let's see what Isaac does I'm just gonna presume whatever Isaac does is right there are some people you just kind of default to them. If they made the play, it's probably the right play. <laughs> All right, so pots, 320K. The reason I say leading here is viable is because as you get shallower and shallower, taking away whatever equity your opponent has is very valuable. And the hands you want to very often consider leading with are hands that have pretty good equity. And two over cards with backdoor flush draw is pretty good. Maybe it's actually too good to lead, which is perhaps why Isaac may opt to not lead this one. He's given us some thought, though. As you do get shallower and shallower stack from out of position in the big blind on boards that are good for your range, you should be leading pretty frequently. And if you're the big stack and you can apply aggression to this medium stacks at the final table, then that's also a scenario where you want to be leading more often than normal. Over to Bruno. And this is a decision that a lot of people play differently. So what I want you to do is I want you to take a second, think about what you would do in Bruno's shoes here with the ace king. You have backdoor flush draw, two good over cards, but the board's not great for you. In this scenario, when Isaac checks, what would you do? I want you to take a second, think about it, and write what you would do in the comment section below. In this scenario, would you just check it back? 
Would you bet small, like 100,000? Would you bet medium, like 200,000? Or would you bet big, like 300,000? Go ahead, pause the video. I'll wait for you. All right, did you do it? Good. Going through this active learning process is going to go a long way to helping you improve your poker skills because it's kind of like you're in this high risk, high dollar value spot and you can get my feedback and Bruno's feedback. So in this scenario, I think with Ace King, you do not want to bet because if you bet and get shoved on, you have to fold, but you actually do have pretty good equity against all the draws, right? So in this scenario, in Bruno's shoes, you typically want to be betting with just your best hands that are happy getting it all in, and then some junky draws, perhaps a hand with like a 5 or a 10 that is okay betting and then folding. Obviously, there aren't a ton of those hands, but I think you'd be okay betting a hand like Ace-5 suited if you even have it in your range, and then folding it if you get shoved on. You could also bet some really high equity draws, but even then, I think it might be right just to check, check, flop, call a turn bet, fold to whoever bet if you don't improve, because... Even though Bruno is the short stack, he still has 20 big blinds, and if he gets out of his hand with 13, 14, 15 big blinds, it's okay. So this is a spot where I think check back is by far the right option. And Bruno should be checking on this board a lot, just because this board is not good for him, right? Bruno is not opening a whole lot of the middle cards, whereas Isaac Haxon is defending all of them. So in that scenario, you have a big range, well, not a big range disadvantage, but it's, you're certainly not a big favorite, and for that reason, you want to be doing a lot of checking. I can already tell you, Isaac Haxon is probably going to be bluffing in this scenario. Whenever the board is not great for the opponent, as it's not here, this is a spot where you do want to be betting with a lot of your hands that have decent equity but completely lack showdown value. And I think this Jack-10 is a great hand to do this with. Isaac has to be a little bit careful that he does not make this play with every potential bluff. And in this scenario, I think a lot of potential bluffs are going to be hands like king high and worse. And if you think about Isaac's defending range as the big stack against a you know person who has to be aware of ICM... Isaac does get to defend incredibly wide. So if Isaac is in this scenario with like literally every bluff and he opts to bet every single bluff, which uh, maybe he does. I don't think he does. I'm joking, Isaac. Um, if he does actually bet every single bluff or a lot of them, then you're bluffing way too often. And if your opponent's good, as Bruno gets in there and battles, right? I mean, he's making deep runs in these high stakes tournaments on GG on a regular basis. You have to be a little bit careful about over bluffing. That said, this Jack-10 is a very obvious bluff. It never wins at the showdown. It has decent equity, so this is a spot where Isaac is pretty forced to go for it, I think. Unless he thinks Bruno's flop check back range is a lot of very strong hands, or strong marginal hands, like a lot of over pairs, that just are never folding, but that's probably not the case. By the way, you can go back and rewatch all of these final table streams at ggpoker.tv. They have a lot of these final table cards up reviews featuring many of the best players in the world, so get to studying. Isaac does go for the bet. Bruno's going to take his time, and he opts to call. You may say, why call here with the ace-king? It's not a great spot, but like I said, if Isaac is betting with a lot of draws, ace-king's the best hand. The nice thing about ace-king is it actually beats all the draws, right? Now we have an interesting river, the three of clubs. I think on pretty much all rivers, <laughs> besides perhaps an ace I think Isaac probably has to go for the bluff because it's very easy for Bruno to just have a lot of ace highs here or some pairs, right? And you may say, wouldn't you be scared of a king? I mean, yeah, king's not great, but Bruno could easily be sitting here with ace queen, ace jack, ace 10, all of which will fold to a river bet. You got to presume. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. So I think this is a scenario where unless it is really the exact worst card, the ace, I think Isaac just has to go for it. Because realize Isaac could easily have a full house here. He could easily have a straight here. He could easily have a flush here. And, you know, he may even be able to go for thin value with a hand like a nine. Like, I don't think that would be absurd if you think your opponent's range is a lot of under pair type hands or ace high type hands, right? So I think this is a pretty easy all in for Isaac. It is worth noting that if he does go all in, Bruno's getting pretty good odds. So he may start finding hero calls. I'm certainly not going to critique Isaac Haxon's play. But on the turn, maybe he wants to go just a little bit smaller, rewound here a little bit. Because if he bets a little bit less on the turn, yeah, he's going to not have quite as much fold equity on the turn, but he's going to give Bruno slightly more chips on the river, which may result in him making a few more folds with hands like this ace-king that, you know, really could conceivably find a hero call. Um, so if Isaac bets like 200 here, then the pot would be 150 fewer chips, so it'd be 700, and Bruno would have about 
650, in which case then you can jam for about pot on the river, and I think that might actually get you a whole lot more fold equity. Of course, I could be wrong about that. So anyway, I think Isaac has an easy all-in even in, in this scenario. I do realize the solver very often goes for geometric bet sizing. Here, Isaac went slightly bigger on the turn and then slightly slightly smaller size proportionally on the river. So anyway, facing this shove, what in the world does Bruno do? Well, if you think, think about it, what cards do you want to have in your hand to block effective nut hands for Isaac? Well, I think you want to have the Ace of Clubs, which Bruno has. Maybe a hand like the King of Clubs or the Queen of Clubs or the Jack of Clubs or the Ten of Clubs. All of those are viable. I think Ace of Clubs is certainly relevant, though, because that is a hand that Isaac would very likely bet the turn, like, say, at Ace-Two of Clubs, and then he would jam the river. But obviously, he can't have that because Bruno has the Ace of Clubs in his hand, right? So that's good. I think you probably also don't mind having a hand like an Eight because I think definitely think Isaac would play straights this way a decent chunk of the time. So I think having an Eight would be quite nice. Um, but really, Bruno's going to have almost no eights unless he has pocket eights. If he did have pocket eights, I think it's a pretty easy call on the river. Um, so in this scenario, you got to realize, Bruno effectively loses with almost all of his bluff catchers to all of Isaac's value betting range. So in that scenario, you just want to have blockers in your hand that makes it harder for Isaac to have the nuts or the effective nuts because those are primarily the hands he's going to be jamming. I'm not, I'm not sure if he jams a nine on the river in this scenario. So if he is jamming only full houses, flushes, and straights, any cards you have in your hand that makes it more likely that Isaac does not have a full house, flush, or straight makes it proportionally more likely that he has a bluff. And you may say, would he really bluff in this scenario? Well, clearly he is. I would not be shocked if Isaac is over bluffing in this scenario because it's pretty good. And in this scenario, with big ICM implications, big payout implications, you should be bluffing a ton because Bruno's risk premium is through the roof. I have a tournament masterclass at pokercoaching.com where I have a very, very big... Uh, payout implication section where we go through all sorts of ICM considerations and we discuss how to like roughly estimate re risk premiums and this is a scenario where risk premium is quite high because notice based on the pot odds Bruno needs to win something like I don't know 28% of the time could be wrong someone check me in the comments do the math um, but based on risk premium he may need to actually win something like I don't know 40% of the time something like that and it makes it to where you have to make substantially more hero folds. That said, ace-king beats all the ace highs that Isaac may bluff. That said, you block the ace, so maybe that's not so good. But you also have this ace of clubs, and I wouldn't fault Bruno for making a big hero call here. Um, knowing that Isaac likes to get in there and battle hard, that's an even bigger reason to call. So, dicey scenario, but I, I think it probably is just a nasty, nasty call. Also, notice if Bruno folds and he's like the clear short stack, which is not really where you want to be. So this is a spot where I think Bruno does have some busted draws, like random hands with a 10 that are not so happy. Random hands with an 8, like ace-8 suited that's not so happy um, that will fold. If Bruno does call this, maybe he's overcalling. I'm not sure. It's tough. This is a very, very dicey spot. Let me know what you think of Bruno's play here. I don't know if he's going to call or fold. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. I think... I'd probably find a rough hero call. I mean, again, that may be me being results-oriented because um, I can see that Isaac's bluffing. I don't think so, though, because there are a lot of bluffs available. It's important to note, even though the flush came in, think about all the bluffs Isaac could have. Any hand containing an 8 that doesn't have a pair is going to consider bluffing. Any hand containing a 10 is going to consider bluffing. Maybe any hand containing a 5 is going to consider bluffing. I mean, like, that alone is just a whole boatload of hands. Um, every once in a while, I, it is worth noting that Isaac may bluff a hand like... 5-3, 8-3 suited, right, that uh, made a pair. I think that'd be very, very viable. So uh, that'd be pretty brutal if uh, Isaac was jamming with 8-3 and you end up losing with the ace-king. Now, maybe Isaac doesn't have all the 8-3 suited as pre-flop, but as a big stack, even facing a two-big blind raise, I think he can. Anyway, what you're going to do, Bruno? You're taking your time. Come on, man. They give you plenty of time at the final table on GG. Sorry, everyone. You talk way too long, says, says the people in the comments. Such is life. I apologize. It's Bruno's fault this time. Bruno does make the hero call of the tournament, and he collects a very, very, very nice pot. That's a call I think a lot of people don't make, but that's going to result in Bruno chipping up to about 40 big blinds. And while he did not win the tournament, he did take second. So, insane run for Bruno over the last three weeks. He had a first place, he had an eighth place, and he had a second place. This time, though, Anatoly Filatov took home the title, and won the game. Again, if you want to check out that full replay, check it out at ggpoker.tv. 
That's going to be it for today. Hope you enjoyed this hand. If you did, do me a quick favor. Click the like and subscribe buttons below. I would appreciate that. Enjoy yourself. Have fun and make the most of your experience. I appreciate you being here. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. And as a thank you, I'm going to channel all of my poker knowledge into your brain right now. Oh wait, that didn't work. Sorry, you're gonna have to keep studying. Go ahead and click the subscribe button right here and I'll see you in the next video.